Welcome to the Soul Craft Your Life podcast. My name is Carmen Marshall, and I'm a life design and manifestation expert, a seven-figure entrepreneur, wellness educator, and a dance teacher. And I'm passionate about helping you create a magical and fulfilling life. Whether you want to discover your purpose, learn how to attract financial abundance, or create more health, balance, joy, and connection in your life, the Soul Craft Your Life podcast has got you covered. One part strategy and one part soul. Each week we explore both the practical and the spiritual with intriguing experts and fascinating human beings, all sharing their wisdom to help expand what we think is possible for our own lives. The goal? To help you create a life you love on your own terms that stems from your soul. Let's dive in and discover what this life has to offer each of us. Hi, gorgeous souls. I have a really special guest for episode two, Rick Cowley, who is the creator of Vision Quest, one of the most powerful personal, professional, and spiritual growth programs on the planet today, which helps successful entrepreneurs who are feeling lost in finding their true path in life and work. Rick discovered his unique wisdom when he faced his mortality, leukemia, at 21 years old. He then created the Vision Quest process to give others a similar experience of self-discovery, but without the life-threatening illness. The process was refined and perfected during 60-plus Vision Quest retreats. I wanted to interview Rick as one of my first guests, not only because I've been to two of his incredible retreats, and also not only because I believe knowing our purpose is crucial to living a fulfilling life, but because... What I really wanted to talk about is the fact that living our purpose is not always a straightforward or easy path, right? Even after a life-changing experience. Even though Rick awakened to his purpose after battling leukemia, it still took him many years to run his first retreat because like all of us, he had his own doubts, his own limiting beliefs, and his own life distractions. But most importantly, what was it? that finally helped him step fully into living his purpose and doing his first retreat. And how now, 60 retreats later, from Mexico to Bali to Australia, he's impacted hundreds of humans, including me, to center their lives around what they love, follow their inner guidance, and do what they're meant to do in their lifetime. I hope you can see yourself in Rick's journey and wisdom and feel inspired to go after your own dreams regardless of any fears, of any doubts, because you're here for your own unique purpose that needs to be expressed in the world. Let's dive in. So Rick, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. I absolutely adore your work. And of course, I've been to two of your retreats that, and I've done one of your online programs, which all of them so changed my life. So super happy to have you here. But before we get started, where are you in the world so our listeners can can visualize where you are? So right now, uh, I'm, I'm just down the street from you, probably you a kilometer from where you live, <laughs> um, coincidentally. And this is in the Sunrise Beach, Australia. Uh, it's next to Noosa Heads. That's, that's the more well-known kind of tourist destination. Um, and so if, you're, if you look at a map of Australia, I think we're about in the midway line all the way on the east coast uh so it's pretty it's pretty good weather normally here and uh it's sort of if you're a surfer living in australia it's on the east coast it's kind of the warmest climate you can get where there's still waves and if you keep going north it gets warmer and warmer but then the waves are blocked by the great barrier reef and there's more sharks and scary things up north Mm. Well, I think there's sharks and scary things everywhere in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Peter's always telling me about that too whenever he goes surfing. Yeah, it's it's so funny because we met in Bali and then we both ended up here in the same place just after COVID hit. And so it's, yeah, it's been such a, such a neat journey to see our lives kind of over the past four years, really five years since I first did your retreats. And I really want to get into like what your retreats are about, but before we do that, um, can you describe in your words what you do? I think in the simplest terms, I I am a purpose catalyst. Yeah, so I help people um, connect deeply with their truest, deepest voice inside and understand who they are and wake up to what they're really here to do. 
uh, and the the heart and soul of that is your your life purpose. You know, what were you put here to do? Who were you put here to be? What's the impact that you were put here to have? Mm. Yeah, and there's just I as I said, I just don't think there's anything more. What we're here to do and be and why we're here is just so important, and I think we're all seeking that. So, can you explain a little bit about why your retreats are so different? Oh, I like that. I like that question. Um, okay, why they're so different? Okay, ma- here's the first thing. I've never done a retreat before, so I, I had no, I had no model of any experience to base any of what I do off of. Um, so that that could be one thing. Okay, give me a moment to try to get to the the essence of why why it's different. It's the space that that is created that allows people to listen to their soul. And there's, you know, there's, there's certain concepts that are introduced and ideas that are shared, but it's, it's like the, the minimum possible. Like I, it's not about, I always say it's not about filling you up with more ideas. It's about making a space for you to hear your truth. And I think that Mm -hmm. that's what's so unique. Uh, Yeah. And then, and over the years I've found that, almost like the less I try to do or the less I try to create a certain experience for someone. It took, it took dozens of retreats to get to this understanding for myself that the more I just make that space and ask good questions that the, the deeper the connection that happens in the person. And that's like, that's one of the foundation things is like, you have to connect to yourself before you can hear those answers. And there, there's a certain, uh, a certain uh, like sequence of steps that we go through that I, I didn't even realize we were going through until I reflected on it years later when a friend of mine asked me, what, what's the overall like arching steps you go through? Um, but any, one of the early mm. ones is, is, uh, um, inner knowing, but basically to me, that means like connecting with that deepest part of you. And then with these, these questions, it's deepening that, that connection and giving that voice inside of you space to speak and space to be heard. And then not just heard, but captured on the page. So, um, so it's like, after it speaks, you capture it on the page and then the rest of you, your personality and your ego and your body and, you know, all the other parts of you, the human parts of you can look at it. And oftentimes you don't remember writing what you wrote, but it feels amazing when you read mm-hmm. back through this, um, you know, essentially guidance for your life. Uh, and, you know, you're writing about the things that are deeply important to you the your purpose your dreams the what you really want your life to be about and um so yeah it's like kind of the combination of those elements um takes people to a place of deep connection deep deep clarity and then having it having it on the page as this guidebook that you take with you into your life and and you 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 use it as like kind of a guide map for the next phase of your life mm. Yeah, I, I from my personal experience of your retreats, the container and the ability to have that crystal clarity about what your purpose is, like nothing else that I've ever done. And then to have a way to actually manifest that and have it actually come into reality in your world. And I think for me, that was so different, like to have that space. It's not like a retreat. We, we do, well, I did the one in Bali, so we did lots of things like we're on scooters and we're, you know diving off of cliffs. And so there was a doing aspect, but it was always more in your body. But it's not a retreat where you're like, you're busy doing volleyball and doing all these things that you don't have time to really connect with yourself. And I thought that was, it just gives you that space to really hear what your soul, what you are trying to tell yourself. And then how do you actually make that happen in the world? Mm. Yeah, it's, I, I think purpose is probably one of the most important things that we can figure out in our life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's that's like my deepest inspiration is that someone can say at the at the end of their life they can say, 
I did what I was put here to do. And there's no question. There's not like, oh, did I, did I, did I leave that stone unturned? Did I back away because I was too scared? Did I, did I, did I not take that path because I didn't even know what it looked like? I was just too busy, you know, whatever, surviving or accumulating those kinds of things. It's the, it's the purpose. That's been the source of the biggest magic in my life. The Mm -hmm. deepest human connections, um, the greatest experience of of being in the flow of life. And then of course, my greatest sense of like service and fulfillment has come from being and um, living my purpose and which is helping other people discover and be and live their purpose. Mm-hmm. And you've done 60 retreats now. I mean, 60, incredible. So when did you start and what inspired you to start the retreats? Maybe give our listeners a little bit about your background, um, what inspired you, and then kind of a journey of 60 retreats. I mean, that's incredible. Yes, yeah. So the, the, the original seed for the retreats, um, for the process, um, which is, I call the vision quest, um, spelled with a Y, V-Y-S-I-O-N, um, the original seed for this was planted when I was 21 years old and I got really sick. I'd been living and studying in Indonesia for a year and I got, I got really sick and had to uh, cut that um, trip a bit short and went straight to a hospital in Hawaii where my parents met me. They flew over from California just to shorten the flight for me. And um, I was diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, so that was, that was, it was a period of about eight months from getting, you know, really almost losing my life, like getting that ill and, um, and then starting some, a blend of, Western treatments and Eastern treatments and um, doing chemotherapy. And, um, and at, after eight months of treatment, I was, I was cancer free, but that eight months, I guess that was like my, that was like my container. That was my, my real, um, my own vision quest. And I, you know, I, I always say it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I remember, I remember um, it, at that time, one of my f- friends, one of my university friends, he was studying um, journalism in university. And he invited me and another one of our friends who had broken his neck, um, I think body surfing or bodyboarding. And he was doing like a, a, a newspaper article on us. And he, so he was kind of asking us questions like this, you know, what did you learn from your experience? And, um, and this other guy, Eric Hermstead, he said, he said it was one of the best things that ever happened to me was breaking my neck. Mm-hmm. And I said, why? And he said, because I got clear on what I wanted and nothing could stop me. And I was like, I think I'm going to use that. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I'd like to live like that. Mm. And having, you know, had leukemia, it's just this, it's funny. It's like this golden ticket where you can just do and be and say anything you want to do and be and say. And so I, I, I came out of my shell in a lot of ways from that experience and being less concerned about like pleasing people or less concerned about what other people thought of me way more brave about saying what I was thinking and feeling, which, um, which used to terrify me. And, and when you're, when you face your mortality, there's just this, this, um, this sense of, whoa, I thought I was going to be here permanently. It just feels permanent. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like you wake up in the morning, you live your whole day, you go to bed at night. And then the next day you wake up, (laughs) you live your whole day, you go to bed at night. That happens thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So we don't remember anything differently, different. And it's hard for us to conceptualize. Like, even as I say this, some people will start to get these kind of chills and go, oh my God, that's right. Like there's going to be a day when the sun rises And I'm not going to be here anymore. Some people will feel that and other people just go, that's an interesting concept. 
but when you face your mortality or if you have someone close to you face their mortality or pass away, then it's right in your face and you just, that part of you that can just shut it off, it, it can't overpower the presence of this truth, you know, that we are here for this temporary lifetime. And it's so empowering to have that perspective. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the, the things that I miss from being face to face with my mortality. And it's something that, you know, as you're healthy for a longer and longer period of time, uh, you start to kind of go to go to sleep again of on that mm -hmm. fact of life of like how precious and temporary this time is and all this shit I'm worrying about. It doesn't matter at all. Like when I'm taking my last breaths, I'm just going to be grateful for all of it. So I got to see at that young age how temporary my life is and everyone's life is. And then I had, I literally had a very special space in my life where I wasn't going to university. I was just, I was just healing, you know, I was doing, focusing on my health and eating well and researching treatments and all this stuff and connecting deeply with people. And I had a mentor at that time as well, um, Dr. Ted Orcutt in San Diego. And I started to uh, listen to that deeper voice inside myself and realizing that like my life up to that point had been um, probably the single greatest driver had been surfing, which I started when I was about 15 years old and I just fell in love with it and it became the center of my life. And then it was like, you know, par my parents' expectations or you know, whatever other expectations from society, but like it was, it was from my parents, it was like, you go to college. And um, I, I just went to college, but I didn't really want to go. I wasn't excited about most of the classes that I had, but it's just what you do. And so I got sick in my third year of university when I, when I went to study abroad. And um then once I, so, so once I started to kind of like connect about what I really wanted to do and who I was and what I wanted my life to be about, then I, I started to make some uh, changes to align my life with that. And, and it, it's a process, man. It's not like overnight you go like the, say this, this vision quest work, which is the, 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 the truest expression of my purpose. It was 13 years from when I got sick to when I ran my first retreat. So it, it was a process coming up with that. You know, it's like you, you tune in and you get clarity and you make some adjustments to be more true to yourself and in, in how you live in your lifestyle in the person that you are, the people you spend time with, what you do for work, all of that. And What I, you know, to go back to your first question, what makes the vision quest, what makes the, what the work I do so unique is it's like, it's like what I got from my experience of having leukemia and then the next 13 years of making these adjustments and tuning in in my life, it's like that compressed into, um, it's six days now, if you do the retreat in Australia or 28 days at home, it's all that wisdom, all those the concepts and the questions and the space and the, 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 um, I want to say tricks, the tricks that I use to quiet down your mind and quiet the fear and let you really connect to yourself. It's, it's just such a potent, it's a distillation of all of that life experience put into this super potent, mm. uh, process. What was the question? Yeah, no, it was, it was so good because I actually didn't know there was 13 years from when you had leukemia to when you did your first retreat. What was the impetus to say, okay, I want to do this? And, and did you have doubt about it? Was it hard to do that first retreat? What, what made you want to and what was the journey in getting that first retreat out there? Yeah, it was, it was a big inner battle um, facing fear, basically. And when when i would so writing exercises for me have always been the most powerful way for me to connect to my truth and get a, a better perspective on my life get clarity and to catalyze change and over the years 
when I I would come across a writing exercise or I'd read a book or something that would you know have a process about you know connecting with your dreams or whatever, um, and these this idea of a retreat would always be there. You know, mm. it's like it it never left. <laughs> it never became another dream. It was like okay, if I am painfully honest with myself, what I really want to do is run a retreat where we do this deeper work with people and I help them. Um, the, the original idea was get into the flow in their life. And as you know, the retreats used to be called surf life for the first number of years. But the, um, yeah, it's really interesting looking back and looking at the timeline of things. So I was afraid though, of when I would get that idea, I would get inspired and I'd go, ooh, and I'd start to like think about what what the content would be and, you know, where we could do it and, you know, what, how much would it cost and all this kind of logistic stuff. And then I would just get scared and the kind of, the, the, the voice inside of me was saying things like, who are you to have a profound impact on people's lives? Like your life isn't perfect. You, you need to get your life more perfect before you can help other people and run a retreat and you need to have more money and you need to be more successful and you need more training, you need more qualifications, like all this stuff. And it would, it would stop me. And that dream would kind of go back to sleep for a couple of years. Mm. And um, there was a, a, one of my, so I'm, I'm from California and um, my ex-wife Pia is from Australia and we have two kids and one of, we would go um, back to the States kind of periodically. And one of the trips back, I, I went into a used bookstore in Sydney. I was flying by myself this time, uh, maybe before my family went. And I just went into this used bookstore, picked up a book. Um, it, was, it was like thick paperback book with yellowed pages. And it was called Do It, A Guide to Living Your Dreams. And I thought, that sounds like a book I want to read. That's really cool. This was before I'd, you know, done the retreats and, um, and it had a life purpose exercise in there, which is the, is the foundation of the life purpose exercise that I guide people through. Um, but I didn't create that exercise. So I'm, I'm happy telling people where it came from. Um, and I did this exercise and you know what it is. You express your life purpose in two words. It's a, it's a, it's a characteristic word, like a, like a, um, a way of being, uh, um, a characteristic is like happy or excited or caring, that kind of thing. And then the second word is the doer of an action. Um, so like teacher or mentor or guide or something like that. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what mine is because it's a very sacred, personal, um, like fuel source. Mm. Um, but I did that and it was like, once that piece fell into place for me, that was when I hit a tipping point and I couldn't not do the retreat. Mm. It was like, you know, all these years I've been kind of clarifying puzzle pieces of my life's vision and my purpose. Mm. And that was the central piece. The life purpose is like the piece in the center that connects all these other pieces of your vision. And once that fell into place, it was like, ah, oh, I get who I am. I get mm. what I'm designed for. Mm. And then, of course, you know, the f I, I start thinking about the retreat again, doing the first one. And then the fear is just in my face, just going, you are not ready. You're not qualified. And I finally got to, I was in Australia at this point. I finally got to a place where I was like, I was so mad at myself for not having done it. Um, not having at least tried it that I, I was going crazy. Like I couldn't stand myself. And I just said, fuck it. I have to try this. I have to try this before I die, you know? So, um, so I did, I, I, it, it morphed after I put it out there is originally going to be like a kind of a personal growth slap slash, um, surf coaching retreat. And it, it morphed into a retreat, uh, for young adult cancer survivors. And, um, 
the reason that that was so important for me was that, and this is something that I, w I would love for people to take away from, from this interview, is that what I found is that you need to have a bridge towards a dream, especially a purpose-driven dream, because it's going to mean so much to you and you're going to want it to be perfect and as good as possible mm. and, a, and a success. And because it really, it really, um, you know, it like represents your soul. So mm. we feel so scared that like, what if it's just a flop? What if no one wants to do it? What if no one wants to come, you know? Uh, so the fact that, that it was, um, it became for young adult cancer survivors. I just knew, even if I just, even if I sucked at this work and, and my first one, and it was disorganized, I had no idea what I was doing, that I knew that just from my experience in my life, that it would still be valuable for, for mm -hmm. people to come and just have, have a space to connect and share and, um, and support each other and, and a really unique journey like a, a young adult cancer survivors don't have a lot of there's not a lot of young adult cancer survivors there's not a lot of support support groups that kind of thing and it just turned out to be um, a really pivotal experience mm -hmm. and the 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 very the rudimentary process that i did put together what it worked it, and it was powerful and it brought people to tears and laughter and and you know all that all that great stuff and so once i experienced that first retreat then it was like okay <laughs> um i want to say like okay old life is done i'm now on this next like purpose driven chapter of my life um but still what it wasn't an overnight thing either that was a that was an adjustment over many years and doing one or two of those cancer survivor retreats every year and then um, moving to Bali and opening the retreats up to entrepreneurs, professionals, parents, anyone who mm. has the sense that they've got more to offer the world, but either aren't sure exactly what it is or have that, that fear, you know, they're procrastinating, putting it off. And what, and what I see is that, you know, with your life's vision, if you don't have enough of the puzzle pieces of your life's vision, then it, it's too unknown and it's too scary for most people to take the leap and, and stop doing what they're doing. Like if they're in a job that they hate or the, a business that's just like sucking the soul out of them. If the, if you don't have enough clarity of what that vision is, you'll stay, you'll stay in that spot because it's, it's scarier to leave and step into this, this vision that's really patchy. But if you have enough of those pieces, what happens is you can't not step towards that vision it's so right for you and it just starts to pull you forward and so that's that's really been what um what's at the heart of my work is helping people find enough of those pieces that it switches from going i hope one day i wish i wish i hope it you know something changes something can happen to going i can't not do it and that was what that that life purpose piece gave me and I just became obsessed with this idea. And I was like, I have to at least try it. I have to, um, you know, put a program together and find a group of people and guide them through it and just see. And if it sucks, then at least I'll know. And I can let that, I can let this go and maybe, you know, work on something else that inspires me. But uh, I I finally got up the courage uh, and it was, it was, it was out of frustration and anger with myself that I hadn't done it yet, uh, that I actually got the courage to do it. I think it's so important. Some of the things that you said about that dream wouldn't leave you, like you kept thinking about it. And I think it's so good for all of us to think, what is that dream that just will not leave us? That we, we always keep thinking about whether we dream about it, whether we think about it during the day, whatever it is. And then to know that there's going to be so much resistance around it. And all the things that come up, am I good enough? Who's going to listen to me? It's just so normal. Like we all go through that. Yes. And I love that little bit where you said, I found like my soul fuel or what it was that was going to help me bridge that gap by that, that statement that you teach a course in, in your retreats. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, well, there was one moment, there's so much, this process came from the participants, people like you and the, sh the sharing that happens around the table as we reflect on the writing exercises. And, and there was, there's one exercise where you, uh, you look in your past at your, 
your most meaningful um, blessings and achievements in your life. And, um, and as we discussed those, there was a participant, um, Jamie, who said, you know, we, we kind of said, what, what were the commonalities of the things that these, these big dreams that each of us had had lived, you know, the things that were most meaningful in our lives. And he goes, it, he goes, it's like, after everyone shared, he goes, it's like, there's a deep inner knowing that this is what you're here to do. Like, this mm -hmm. is what you have to do. And I don't know if I'd ever heard that phrase inner knowing before, but it's mm -hmm. now like a key part of the, part. the quest, <laughs> like terminology. And that's, that's a really, just to kind of like support what you were saying, that's a really powerful place to, to when you're, when you're starting to look forward and go, okay, what do I want the rest of my life to be about? is to look backward and go, okay, what were those, those dreams? Like there was just things that I did that, that I knew I had to do. It, it's, it's like, it wasn't even a choice. Like it could have been graduating from university or it could have been, you know, building houses in Nicaragua, or it could have been writing a book or moving to a certain neighborhood and buying a house or, you know, whatever those things are. But it's like something is calling you towards that to, to do it and to keep going mm -hmm. and it's it's like this change in perspective of of like i really really hope this dream happens one day i really really hope i meet the person or i really really hope i get the business idea it changes it goes from that to going i can't not do this thing mm -hmm. no matter how much it scares me i can't not do it and mm -hmm. that's that's the kind of clarity that I love taking people to where, and it's, it's on the page and it's, there's so much kind of evidence that it compels you. It's just this, this basic understanding of who you are and what you're here to do uh, so much that you can't not do it and you, you can't not be your purpose. Mm. Yeah. You become an unstoppable. And I, th I think the whole focus on the inner knowing helps you trust yourself and stop listening to not only negative thoughts, but what other people think you should do for your life. And I think when we start to trust ourselves, A, to be able to hear what am, what am I feeling? What am, what, is, what am I trying to tell myself? We have to figure out, and I think your process does that so well, how we can hear, but then how do you take action be, without letting what everyone else thinks? <laughs> you know, what would be a cool meditation and just uh, write it down and go, oh, this is the process. It's like, this was in the trenches. And yeah. I tried stuff that worked. I tried stuff that didn't work. I got feedback from hundreds of participants. I, I, I watched the, how it landed with people. I got their feedback in the moment. I saw what happened in their lives in the months and the years afterwards. And um, so it's, it's, it was through 60 plus versions that the vision quest has gone through to get to where it is. And uh, and, and I think that that's another message that can hopefully really inspire people to go, you know, I really, I've got a process in me. I've got a book, I've got a course or whatever it is, like get that first draft down and get it, like got, take people through it or put it in people's hands and, um, and get their, get their feedback. Um, and, and, and it's not like, um, It's not like you need other people to like, you know, edit it and change it and that, but it's like life will show you like either what they give, what they give you back will either resonate with you or it won't. And there's feedback that I've gotten at the retreats that pissed me off in the moment. And I'm just, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, screw you. You don't know what you're talking about. I've been doing this so many times. Like, that's not the energy of this. This is the energy of this. I know what this is about. And then maybe the next retreat, uh, uh, I love trying new things. So I'll, I will introduce something, you know, okay, maybe we'll do meditation, you know, before we start talking or, you know, like change the order of things or whatever. And there's been, there's been some that I can think of a few things where in the moment I was like, no, that was, I, I hate your feedback, <laughs> even though I wouldn't say that. And now that's, now that's how I do it. And I saw, yeah. okay, that was a really valid perspective that actually was, um, you know, made this process better. So I think that's the kind of 
the kind of attitude is just like open, be open, because you just want the thing to be as powerful as it can be and to serve its purpose as best it can. Mm -hmm. And so the more minds and hearts that that are aligned, that are supportive of it, um, that can sort of participate in the uh, in, in the could, could be the creation or in in the refinement of mm -hmm. whatever it is, then probably the better and the faster it will get there. Yeah, and the fact that you've done 60 and it's been a, a refining and a distilling, you know, every single time, you know, I think that's what also makes it so different and so potent. And I, I think it's good for people to realize too, even once you find your purpose, it's not like everything opens up and everything's rainbows and unicorns. There's still a refinement. There's still doubt. There's still like you still had to keep, you know, continuing. It wasn't always easy. Time for a quick commercial break. Hi, this is Carmen and I'm sponsoring myself. And since this topic is so related to meaning and purpose, I wanted to encourage you to go to my website and there you'll find my official Soulcraft quiz to discover what your soul's really craving. It's only seven questions, so it'll take you two to three minutes max and it will help you hone in on what your soul really wants. Hint, the answer may surprise you. And even if you already feel on track with your purpose, the quiz can help you with important distinctions. And if you're completely new to purpose and your soul's calling, this can be a crucial first step. So go to karmamarshall.com forward slash quiz to take this fun, free, and illuminating quiz. Now let's get back to the podcast. And can you speak to that? Because I think that's important. Because I think a lot of people think, well, once I find my purpose, everything's just going to be easy and it's going to flow. Can you yeah. speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I think this is this has been a big a big part of my journey, where on the retreats, like that's my zone, and I I have like I'm I'm overconfident in that zone, you know, like I'm, and it's not like I'm not loudly overconfident, but I'm so confident in this that I know I, I don't even have to say anything. I could sit there and be quiet and you will still have like the most clear, one of the most clear and profound experiences of your life. And, um, and then in between the retreats, is where okay this is where like the rest of the business things happen you know marketing and admin and accounting and oh you know all this other stuff that doesn't come naturally to me and it's definitely been a journey of like okay, how do you how do you find purpose and um that same sense of confidence that i do on the retreat how do i find that in the whole overarching mm -hmm. journey this um, um, of this this business or this mission, and it's something that I I just feel like just recently I'm getting a much stronger foundation since moving to Australia uh, at the beginning of COVID. So I've been here just over two years, and it was it was uh, it was a big transition from Bali, where I had a had an awesome lifestyle, very active and, you know, kind of full of that adventure and flow, mm. Bali, Bali magic. And I was coming back frequently because I have two kids here, but, um, but it's been really right for me to be here living in Australia where my kids are and seeing them, you know, every week and spending, you know, way, way, way more time with them and being, being just a, a, a almost daily part of their lives. Um, but it, it's it, like finding my footing in Australia and my lifestyle here and business here and everything has been, um, I'm going to move the retreats over. That was, that was a pretty smooth transition, fortunately. And it's actually, you know, easier for Australians to get to than, than um, flying to Bali. Flying to Bali. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's, that's flowed really well. And I, I have this sense that, um, well, to back up a little bit, like the retreats, I would, I, I was just really committed over the years to running. I would just decide sort of at the end of one year, I would decide how many retreats I want to run in the upcoming year. So it was anywhere from like probably uh, three to seven retreats I would do every year. And I would 
sit there with the calendar and I would just schedule them in, you know, and I scheduling anything on my calendar used to terrify me. And, you know, I'm going like, what, what, if, what if I wanted to go on a trip or what if something else, else cool comes up? And I realized there's nothing I would rather do than run these retreats. So I would put them in the calendar and I would run the retreats. Like if one person booked, I'm like, okay, it is going. And then more people would always come. Mm -hmm. booked. But that was my mindset. I'm like, if one person books, I'm going to give them the best adventure they've ever had. You know, like the, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to get a one-on-one -on -one amazing process. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's another lesson that I've, I've kind of mentioned to people over the years and th they seem to uh, appreciate that message. Like mm -hmm. this, just this sense of like, if one person signs up, it's, it's on, it's going yeah. forward. And that's going to be a version that I'm going to get feedback on and I'm going to be able to improve on. Um, and then, you know, moving the retreats to Australia, I wasn't sure what I was going to do if I was just going to focus on the online course since when I came to Australia. Uh, but one of my participants who lives down the road here, Barb's, who you're friends with now as well, um, she t picked me up one day and took me to a retreat venue down the road. And she was like, you should do a retreat here. I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll look at it. And then, you know, I've run, I've run about seven retreats there now. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, there's like, it's like the retreats were my, my anchor and I just knew I would put them in the calendar. I would run them and I would figure out the in-between times. And in the past I would, my biggest stress is always been marketing. It's like, it just does not come naturally to me. I'm not like, I'm not, a, I'm not an amplifier. I'm not a promoter. I don't, ha I don't put a big voice out into the world, you know, um, but it w it's word of mouth that has kept the retreats going um, over the years. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm shaking my head now because it's just, I'm just so grateful. It's so magical. And, you know, you were a huge part of that. Um being being at one of the retreats i think it was in the second year of bali retreats that you came to did your your first retreat and you're telling adam hudson uh, a friend of yours you know and he's he's told so many people and they've told other people and um but what i've what i've felt recently is i've i've stopped putting pressure on myself to promote you know, I used to be like, I gotta, I gotta do posts. I gotta do emails, but it, I, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy mm -hmm. doing posts. Like most of the time, I don't enjoy sending out emails. Like I don't, I don't, it's not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not my energy. It's not how I was designed, you know, and it's not the energy of the vision quest. And vision quest is like this, this very quiet magnetic space that just taps someone on the shoulder and the person just knows they can just feel like okay this is right for me and it comes from someone telling them about it they might hear an interview or they might you know they might see a post or an email or something like that and just get this sense but no one needs talking into to do this it's mm -hmm. like hear about it and you get a sense yes yes or no it's yeah. so simple and, but and the yes is like a you can't not do it kind you of cannot a yes. do it yeah that pull is so strong and and that's what do you feel people come to you for the most like is it unhappiness in their work is it literally they want to find their purpose is it just feeling unsettled like what do you find most people come to vision quest for it's, this has been one of my challenges when it comes to marketing because people come for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. And the what's underneath all those reasons, I would say, is a, there's a few common things. Um, one is a sense that they have more to offer the world. That That's connected to like a sense of purpose and that, and that is a common it is a common thing where people go on i just i just feel like i don't have purpose and i would really like purpose and mm. i feel like i do have a purpose i know i have more to offer but i'm 
I'm just running my business or, you know, um, I, I've just been doing this job for ages and I don't know what it is and I don't quite believe in myself. And you know, that's another thing too, is like a, a kind of a people's self-confidence starts to suffer. And from the outside, we think we see people who are successful or they have their own business or they've created an awesome lifestyle and we just go, oh, they don't need anything. They're mm -hmm. set, they're happy and they're successful and they're set. But what I've seen is that everyone is still human and everyone has those things that they feel self-conscious about or they feel critical of themselves for or stuck in. And, um, and I think when, when your soul is wanting to guide you to a certain place, like wanting you to, to look at your purpose and do something more meaningful for your work or be more authentic in your relationships and you're, you're not for whatever reason, then I think it, it affects your, your self-confidence and you start to doubt yourself and you start to like become afraid of any decisions and feeling like you're going to make the wrong decision and feeling overwhelmed. Um, so that's kind of a, that's kind of a common thing too, which actually becomes a really beautiful thing because of the vulnerability and the vulnerability of everyone there. Um, you know, no one comes and pretends that they have all their shit completely together at mm. this, at this, <laughs> at, at the vision quest, you know, mm. like everyone is like, um, you know, there's these parts of my life that are going amazing. And then there's these couple things that I really, really, really want to change. I'm not sure how, and I'm looking for guidance on how. Mm. Yeah. And then sometimes there's, there's like a loss, you know, if people had, you know, maybe, maybe a relationship breakup or there's, there's some tra big transition, a big life transition. Maybe they've sold a business and they've got money and they've got freedom. And now they're, they're more scared than ever. They're going, now, what do I do? Like, um, so it helps them in those times of, of transition. Transition. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. I think for all of us, we have those little niggles of what we want to do with our life or what's possible. And when we stop listening to it or thinking we shouldn't do it because we're, you know, we're in a job that's really good and we don't want to lose that job or, you know, maybe we're disconnected in a relationship or whatever it is. But I think when we stop listening to that, that's where we, as you said, we start to lose confidence because we no longer trust ourselves. And that's what I think is so important about your process as well, because it's connected to that inner knowing, again, listening to ourself, you start trusting yourself again, and that gives you the confidence to start living your life as you want. And it's, I, I think that, that was the other thing, probably your, the, the friend that you met when you were going through leukemia, that whole thing, getting crystal clear and then becoming unstoppable because really what are we, what else are we supposed to be doing with our lives? You know, like we either have a chance to what am I here for? What am I meant to give and go and do it or live a life of quiet desperation and, and being unhappy? And I'm sure what I've seen when people come to your retreat, they come in unhappy or vaguely unhappy and they come out feeling inspired. Yes, I have this life to live. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the you know, other messages I really love to share with people is, is that and I might have mentioned it earlier, but the my the greatest sense of like fulfillment, satisfaction, magic in my life has come from facilitating this process for people. And there was, you know, I, I lived most of my life without that purpose, without this vehicle to to facilitate this work. And I it was just this impossible dream. I just going, I just hope someday that I can, you know, profoundly help people and do something amazing with people. And my one of one of my regrets is that I didn't start these retreats earlier because I think, man, it would be even even more refined than it is now. I would have I would have gotten to know even more people. I would have I would have you know helped even more people. They would have they would have then helped even more people. Mm -hmm. And while 
I have this, I have this like philosophical quandary of when I look, when I look back at my life and I see the most significant things in my life, they all happened on their own. Mm. It's like, you know, meeting someone like meeting the mother of my kids, meeting my girlfriend now, um, getting leukemia, um, just these things happen that we can't plan for. We don't control. We can't rush. We can't make them happen any quicker than they happen. And these are what's like at the heart of our most significant moments and life-changing moments and meetings. So there's that, there's that attitude, which I, I love looking at and going, okay, I don't need to force anything. I can't mm. force anything. And I, you know, from that perspective, I couldn't have started these retreats any earlier than I did. Like the recipe was, it was like in the mixing bowl, you know, it just needed, it needed all those elements needed more stirring and it needed a little bit of like life purpose sprinkled in. Like, okay, we <laughs> stir that in and then it's ready to put in the oven. But I, I couldn't have rushed that process. And at the same time, uh, I don't think that people need to wait 13 years, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have got, if you've got a dream inside of you, a purpose inside of you, you will only, you, you will not regret doing it sooner you will only regret wishing that you'd done it sooner you know you you'll never say i wish i'd waited two more years before i started this this dream you yeah. know and that's that message comes it can come through people mm. so i hope that i'm a I'm a, you know, they, I, I'm funny. I'm like, no, I don't want to put a voice out. I don't have, you know, I don't want to put things into the world, but there are some things, you know, that I want to put into the world. So that's, that's one of them. It's like, don't, don't put this off. Don't wait because you don't know how much time you have. And if you're lucky enough to have a glimpse of what this is, you should, you should do it. And if you don't have enough of those puzzle pieces yet, then, then, then get in there and connect with yourself and dig around and bring these puzzle pieces up to the surface. Yeah. Like we started the conversation. I honestly don't think there's anything more important than figuring out your purpose because everything else stems from that relationships, health, everything, business, everything. Like, like if there's, it's like, if there's one little thread that would affect everything in your life, it's that one thing. So I literally yeah. don't think there's anything more important. Yeah. I thought something really interesting, I think it would be really good for our listeners too. This whole idea that we can think once we find our purpose, everything's just going to flow smoothly, but we still have to live life and there's, you know, we have to do our taxes, we have to do marketing, we have to do things we don't absolutely love doing. So how do you navigate that? And you started to touch on it. How do you navigate the in-between periods between the retreat retreats, um, which I think will be good for people that are maybe starting their purpose, but they're still in a full-time job that they don't like. How do you navigate um, not always doing what you love, but still staying in this, this feeling of how you want to be. And maybe yeah. you can share some of your practices and what you do. Cause I know you have some beautiful things, um, like even what you did this morning and some of your writing exercises, can you share what you do in between retreats? Yeah. Well, this has been, um, a, a change that's been brewing for me for a while that I've experimented with over the last probably four years. But um, it, it, the, the way that I'm looking at it now is kind of like um, taking the pressure off myself because like, as I shared with marketing, that, that to me in my mind feels like my biggest challenge in my life. And uh, and there's, 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 there in the past, there's been no correlation between my effort and, um, people finding out about the retreat and signing up or the online program. Like it, it's, I've had periods where I'm like, it's driving me nuts. Like I'll do I'll, for months, I'll be putting in a lot of effort and like nothing, and then I'll stop. <laughs> and then, um, you know, then a month later, like a, in a week, like a retreat fills up it's, it's had this kind of magical sense to it and it's not, and 
it's not like I did a whole bunch of things and then those were the seeds that planted and then they come out then. It's like they came from things that happened in the moment mm. as if as if it was magic, you know? So I have stopped putting pressure on myself to do things when it's kind of like when I'm not inspired to do them. And the funny thing is like, that was, that was a very original idea. It, like in back in the surf life days is like, act, you know, follow your inspiration, act when you're inspired, but you're not going to be inspired all the time. Mm. So rest if you're not inspired or play or be or whatever, read a book or mm. whatever you, you like doing, pet your cat. And, um, that for me has been working really well and then i've found that inspiration hits to do things that i think i don't really want to do like mm. vacuum or bookkeeping <laughs> things like that mm. but i mean we all know what it's like to be like when when like for example yesterday i I was, it was like in the middle of the day, I'd just been doing stuff and I was going to, I was just going to like have a nap for an hour and, and I just go, oh, you know what? I'll just vacuum this one little section right here. And then I go and go on this vacuuming rampage once I start, you know, mm -hmm. and it feels great. And it's so cold in my house. You, you live, just, live just down the road from me. It's like <laughs> winter time freezing. So I got, I got warm you know, doing housework. Um, and it, it just had this sense of flow to it. And it was actually giving me energy. Mm. And so this is, this is what I'm, um, I'm experimenting with more now as I, as I see, and I've done like one post every three weeks for the last like couple months. And my, mm. my average retreat starting in six days with, with 10 people, you know, it's full mm. and it just happened so easily and effortlessly and right and organically mm. without any pushing without any like effort you know so um i think that's what i would encourage people to experiment with and is to connect to a sense of you know inspiration and also mm. let yourself have downtime i mm. think like that that when i one of the exercises we do is authentic success where you look at your personal life and you you ask yourself what does success mean in my personal life and then the next day it's um in your professional life what does success mean to me in my professional life and it's so fun to hear what people come up with about what their version of success looks like and help to help them shatter some old versions of success you know what what it looks like on instagram or you know on tv and one of mine is to like to be able to take a nap in the middle of the day mm, mm. or to go do yoga or jujitsu or surf in the middle of the day. Mm. And like that, that to me, I realized, whoa, I've set up a really successful life. So um, to, to encourage other people to look at, okay, what is, what does that mean to you? Mm. And do you really want to be busy for 14 hours a day? Like, is that what a successful life looks like to you? Like if you had, you know, all the money you ever needed, would you be running around like a chicken with its head cut off for 14 hours a day? Maybe you would, maybe that's your energy and that's amazing. But um, I think that for all of us, taking some downtime is uh, more beneficial than being busy all the time. And it, it's such an important question. What does success mean to you? You know, I, and I love your analogy. It's not what it looks like on Instagram or what other people think it is, but for you, what is that? And if it means taking a nap during the day or going to jiu-jitsu or teaching dance, and that that is what you feel is success, that's what is more than just money in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I'm seeing is that it equals money in the bank for mm. me. You know, it's just yeah. like, yeah. It's, I mean, how many years has it taken me to learn this, <laughs> to learn this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's, maybe I'm on a 13 year timeline. It's like 13 <laughs> years from leukemia to starting the vision quest, 13 years later to just completely letting go of any pushing and effort and just let it 
let it let it breathe let it have a life a life of its own and mm-hmm. me just like it's like i'm sitting on the back of a horse but it's like this big uh, like fantastical beast horse you know that i'm just sitting on and i'm going whoa i really don't control this thing i am mm-hmm. i am on the ride of this on this, this magical journey you know like stop trying to like kick this thing <laughs> and, and like it doesn't even feel it because it's so big and i'm so mm-hmm. little you know just be a be a be a gracious passenger so that this is a really interesting question how do you flow with life? Because I get this all the time when I'm teaching manifestation and creating the life that you love. The biggest question people always ask is how do you flow and and how do you set goals? So, and and I always have my answer, but I'd love to hear, because it sounds like this is a, a, a big tenant for you right now, like flowing with life, but obviously you still have goals and you still have, um, like your retreats are bigger than ever. So how do yeah. you marry those two? Yeah, I think I think this is another one that depends on someone's nature, because most of the people that I work with, like yourself, they're um, very good at manifesting. They're very good at following through and um, um, succeeding and even surpassing their goals. And I'm more of a flowy dude. I'm really good at like I love travel and I mean, things have changed a bit as I've gotten older, more mature, more responsibilities, wanting to explore these other, you know, parts of myself in terms of manifesting and having an impact. But um, the people, most of the people that I work with are like, if you put something in their sights, they're going to achieve it and they're probably going to surpass it. And what the, what the energy of this work does, which is kind of blending with my energy is it helps them tap into a bit more of a sense of flow, but then also going, okay, what am, what am I going to aim at? Because I can aim at something that is meaningless to me, but just seems like I should be aiming at it, like just money or something like that. Or I could aim at something like I'm going to, I'm going to succeed at whatever I aim at. So, so it's very important to get your aim right. Like mm-hmm. you're, you're mm-hmm. Aim, the clarity your, yeah your purpose and um and that's what's a, so this is even for really say successful people getting that clarity is not is not easy so that's that's when you need you know a, a, a process or someone's support to help you get that get that clarity um it, it's just the fastest mm-hmm. way to do it mm-hmm. but um then for other people who are the say on the more flowy end, they probably need a bit more structure. So it's like, um, you know, having a really clear written goal, and then looking at, you know, I teach uh, in a, in like a follow up program that I have. I teach a weekly planning process. So you're reconnecting with that your biggest dream, but you're just looking at okay, this week, what are my what's my most important action towards this mm-hmm. dream this week. And it, and so some people need that, that refocusing and a bit of, um, it's just keep it super simple. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. This yeah. is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, it's so interesting because you, I think we all have different sides to ourselves and we've got masculine and feminine energy, but you've got, if you can get that crystal clearness, which can be more masculine energy and more focused, but then every day you're deciding, okay, well, what does success mean to me? Am I doing things that I love? Am I surfing? Am I dancing? Am I taking a nap? That brings in the flow. So you, you, to me, you can marry that structure and that clarity with the flow as well. And and I think it's a beautiful way to live. Like you can have both. You know, I, I know yeah. where I want to head, but every day I want to do things that I love so that I feel inspired. And that gives me the energy to even do my taxes yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. or vacuum. Yeah. 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 And I, I think like for me, you know, being more of the flowy nature, it's been looking at the, the things that I do daily that are, uh, that are creating what I want to create from, yeah. you know, the kind of exercise that I do um, or it, there's, you know, if there's a certain work project that I have, like cutting out, um, creating like say an hour every day where I do that. And at the beginning, I have to force myself to do it. And same thing with like, you know, yoga and jujitsu, whatever you have to 
you put it on your calendar and you get a promise i'm doing it three times this week or i'm doing it you know every day of the uh, for monday through friday and at first you have to force yourself but then you 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 i guess it's like your identity changes where you you go okay this is what i do and this mm -hmm. works for me and and as a part of that with work things uh, if you if you do have a project and you know business that you're creating or a book you're writing or a course you're creating or something like that of having that space where you're you you are going to focus on it and having an attitude of listening because mm. that's that's where all the magical ideas come from you know they who knows where they come from but you have to be still enough to hear them and do what you got to do to make that like a sacred space where you know you whatever you sit down with your tea or you put incense on or whatever it is or you have the same time every day and you go okay this is what i'm going to do and even if you um, don't hear a lot in that session you were showing the universe and yourself that you're serious that you're going okay this is the space like this is give it to me here you know <laughs> i'm ready i'm committed yeah, and I think that's the the practices that help us listen to our inner knowing, help us stay connected to our purpose. What can you what do you feel are the two best things that people could do right now in their daily life to start listening to themselves more and start feeling more connected to what they're here to do? And then I want to give them where they can connect with you to to come to your retreat or do an online program. But what could they do right now to help that process? The first thing that comes to mind is journaling. Um, and you can write about the things that are pissing you off and write about the things that excite you. And I think either one of those, I mean, you should have a, have a balance and at least write as much about the things that excite you as the things that piss you off. But those things, they, 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 they get stuff out of your mind and in, you know, we get these like mental tangles and emotional tangles. And it's hard to get clarity and, and see a clear path forward if we have those tangles inside mm. of ourselves. Mm. So to get stuff out on the page is really helpful. And once you switch to where you're starting to write about what you're excited about, then you just, you just go for the ride of mm. starting to write about, okay, what excites me? What inspires me? What gives me energy? And you can aim that at a certain topic you know, if you're like, I really want to have a business that's meaningful, or I want to have a relationship that's meaningful, or I want to, mm -hmm. you know, build my dream home, whatever it is, getting those ideas out, giving them like a channel for them to come through you and get out onto the page where like you can kind of build and start to work with those ideas is mm -hmm. helpful. And, um, and the second thing is, I'm going to, there was a, there was a possible question that you asked about what's your favorite quote. Mm -hmm. And there's a, I heard on a podcast um, from a guy who's a professor at Art Center in Los Angeles, but he is kind of a wise, uh, a wise, mature uh, uh, professor. And he kept saying over and over, he kept saying, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard some version of that before, and I, I Googled it after that, and I saw that Wayne Dyer said said it, but he didn't say that he invented it. So who knows where it first came from, but when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm -hmm. And I see that that's, that's how um, people experience such big changes in their lives after after they do the vision quest is because they're changing how they look at themselves. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like the main thing, how you look at yourself. And, and then I've started to play with that, you know, with my life and with marketing and um, my message and things like that. So that's probably the second thing that I would say is, is ponder that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Look in your in your past, the things that have changed in your life. Did you start to change how you looked at them before they changed? And then you look at your current life and looking forward and going, okay, what would I really like to change in my life? How do I need to look at it differently in order for for it to change? You know, for, mm -hmm. for what I see actually begins to change. I just think mm -hmm. it's a super empowering, inspiring, um, mystical quote. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the power of questions, eh, is, is just everything. Yeah. So just to wrap up with a couple of more questions, what, what is the most important piece of advice you've ever been given? Because you give so much great advice to everybody else. What's the, besides that beautiful quote, what's the most important piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, I think it's trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> like, yeah. It, 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 that's a piece of advice that comes, you know, periodically in our lives. Mm. It was relevant for me at the very beginning of this journey of my purpose. Mm. And it's just as relevant for me <laughs> right now as I look at the evolution of my purpose. Yeah. Mm. And what makes you feel most alive? And why I ask this question is one of the profound things about your retreats is the idea of centering your life around what you love. And that not only impacted how I live my life, it's infused in all my businesses. What for you, like, makes you just feel so alive? It's, it's the magic of what I get to see happen for people. So I don't think it, I can really put it down to a, a, like a specific moment. It's sort of the, the recipe of what happens when you when you put people into a receptive state, ask them a question, and then give them space to hear their deepest, truest answers and write them down. Mm. <laughs> it's so simple and it's so powerful. And what makes me feel most alive is watching people's pens filling up pages and you just know that there's some deep inner wisdom landing on the page watching them read through what they've written watching the expressions on their faces watching them share about it and then and then people get stuck sometimes you know like they they don't get uh, they there's still things that are un, left unclear say after a certain exercise or maybe sometimes the ex, you you get clarity but it just leads to more questions and so you, you know you're left even facing the unknown even more but watching lights go on and people mm. get this clarity from in this this connection it's it's satisfying and magical and i and it comes from like there's not a lot of effort on my part. I'm not, I don't have to manipulate their process. You know, I don't, I, I might give a tiny little nudges here and there and support and this, but it's go, it's happening. It's from them. The momentum yeah. is carrying their own momentum from their whole life and their spirit is carrying them forward. And I just get to like make, make that space for that. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel very alive. Beautiful. Well, where can people find you? So both, because you do both live retreats and online. Yeah, um, visionquest.com. And again, that's spelled V-Y-S-I-O-N, Quest. And that's my um, Facebook and Instagram um, page as well, Vision Quest. Uh, and then my name's Rick Cowley. So um, you can reach out on Facebook. Uh, and and um, on my website, there's a contact um, page and please anyone listening if you're curious got any questions got insights um, if anything resonated with you from this please send me an email I'd love to love to hear from you thank you so much Rick and and I hope everyone does your retreats and at the very least really start exploring your purpose just the most important thing that we can do thank you so much for being here Rick thanks Carmen Hi, gorgeous souls. To celebrate the launch of the Soul Craft Your Life podcast, I'm doing my first ever giveaway. I have some really fun prizes that I'll be announcing in next week's episode, which airs on Tuesday, August 16th. Until then, all you need to do to enter is listen to the episodes, rate and review on iTunes, and then send a screenshot of your review to soulcraft at carmenmarshall.com. You can also get unlimited bonus entries by sharing screenshots of any and all episodes to your Instagram stories, tagging me at Carmen underscore Marshall, and then sending the screenshot to the same email, soulcraft at carmenmarshall.com. 
The deadline to enter is August 31st, and I'll announce the winners on Tuesday, September 6th, the first podcast in September. I'm looking so forward to reading your comments, your takeaways, and then announcing the winners. See you on the next episode.